legitimation and the mandate. I would just make one one little point about this, and I got to keep keep moving here as I see Gary. Um, that it's very interesting that if a person like uh, Mr. Jefferson or Grimshaw or Stuart Hall or Paul Tagaki uh, makes points about uh, the, uh, or some of us in this room make points about the way in which political power and class is reproduced in the, in the nature of policing, the suppression, the violence, the direction of the fatal force, and so on, they are criticized as ideologues. But if Kelly and Wilson talk about broken windows, and claim that they fixed the, the streets of New York with data that are inadequate, totally unsubstantiated, all kinds of overstatement, uh, releases to the New York Times, that considered a major breakthrough in academic life and reprinted in every textbook that uh, one gives. By the time my students come to me as juniors, they've already read Broken Windows, they already know the truth, and I don't. there's no need to my, for my to talk about it. One student put up his hand and said, Professor, are you going to talk more about community policing and its flaws? And I said, well, what do you think? He said, no, we've heard it. I said, well, all right, thank you very much. So they've got their list. They've got the, they may be broken windows. Here's the list. Why do we need Manning to go over this again? I say, I haven't been thinking about it for a while. No, nope, it's all right, teacher. OK, <laughs> go ahead, teacher. Now, uh, I won't go into the, the very much into the, um, uh, the, the issue of uh, the occupational culture other than to say um, that, that, that it's fascinating the resiliency of a handful of cliches have had over a long period of time and reproduced in these reviews, reproduced particularly in reviews that uh, are, are data free. Uh, they have the wonderful opportunity to simply summarize everything that everybody else has done and organize it into some problem categories and, and, and simply reproduce the conventional wisdom but there are some very fascinating developments, and I'll talk about them a little bit uh, later, um, and include the, the major work, actually, that's come from Poppin uh, and from uh, uh, the work of uh, Mastrovsky and, and colleagues on, on, on uh, actually looking at the behaviors of uh, and interaction patterns and how those relate to values that one might attach to the subculture. But in many cases, the subculture idea is everything. It's the dependent variable that explains the independent variable uh, regardless. It's the, it's the independent variable that explains the dependent variable. It's the value ideas that explain the behavior. It's the behavior that explains the values. It's tautological, it's circular, and it has, and, and, and Craig's book, for example, which I would say with due respect, is simply an iteration of these cliches into 57 different versions. It has no, uh, any, something that explains everything explains nothing. And I'm not a occupational culture theorist. My work is, 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 is organizational. Now, I just want to mention, if I make the, the, uh, a couple of points about the ethnocentrism of, of police research, because it's part of the tensions and anomalies of it. Not only is there a, an awkward commitment to somehow making policing better, undefined, through some means undefined, through some purposes undefined, through some political uh, mechanisms undefined, uh, but also that the ethnocentrism of American police studies is very profound. It's beyond even uh, the imagination of most of us in this room. By that I mean that when the word occupational culture or police occupational culture or policing or the police role are used, they are used both denotatively and connotatively as if you're referring to a set of the canonical sources. Um, and this omits the uh, quite serious objection of a number of people, Simon Holdaway uh, and others who have, who have taken up the, the question of whether or not there is in fact and comparability and what dimensions that would involve. But this also omits discussion of the different policing forms, Islamic policing uh, by in traditional Islamic societies, totalitarian policing, for example, in Russia or Germany under Hitler or Taiwan under martial law, continental policing forms where civil law is a fundamentally different basis of, of legality. Uh, and in this furthermore distinctions between private and public policing, again, left undefined. Uh, there's no single identifying matter except that public police might be paid more. 
and all of you who've looked into this know that uh, there's simply no analytically defensible difference. Yet, that's used as a common sense distinction. And then, because it can't be defined, it's easy to say there are four times as many private police, or five times, or six times, or ten times, because no one has the data, and no one has ever defined private. So we go around in circles of that kind, and then repeat it in the textbooks. But I want to suggest that policing, we might think about a definition of policing, and we might think about refining it in terms of democratic policing. And I think I, 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 I ask for your patience on this one. But if we think about policing as legitimate organizations who stand ready to intervene up the fatal force to sustain a politically defined order, then you've got a notion about policing that crosses these simple categories of public, private, vigilante, advocational, vocational, and so on. Uh, and I've emphasized there the legitimacy and the status quo ante. If the status quo ante changes, the police change. Therefore, they are neither radical nor, nor, nor uh, conservative. Secondly, democratic police, it seems to me that the fundamental things that are not, that are dis discussed in democratic policing are assumed. Things like the rule of law, which is one of the, I said once in a Rockefeller Center to someone who had studied Russian law and someone who had studied Chinese law to Mao, and uh, I said, I presume that in Hitler's Germany, they considered that the rule of law was there. And of course, indeed, it was the rule of law. They had very bright Jewish lawyers writing German law that would define precisely what level of grandfather made you a Jew. Now, if that's the rule of law, it is the rule of law, yes. But that is not what we imply by the meaning of rule of law. I said, well, it's, I don't think they would call it. We call it the rule of law. So that's a red herring consistently. The idea of the rule of law somehow has some bearing on these, these matters. But I do think we need to talk about what democratic policing is not. And this I take from Sang Hutsui, you see, Sang, who was, who's written about democratic policing comparatively. And I have the reference in. But he mentions the fact that what should be involved is what the police are, are not permitted to do and assumed to do. And that includes terrorism and counterterrorism, group intolerance, where you focus on groups, such as Iraqis, that you deport because they're Iraqis, or any other student of an Arab country who is not taking above nine hours in a university, must focus on individual delicts, individual violations, torture, and they are sustained by counterforces. It is essential in a democratic society to have counterforces. You must have vigilantes, you must have anti-democratic forces, you must have things to be against, so that you are sustaining a democratic dialogue within the society rather than, uh, as we might say, alternative modes of spreading democracy.